economy, and I make potato chips and sell soda. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of politics in that business. <laughs> um, so it's come in, in, in handy. The other thing I'd uh, say is um, always good to go to school events because that's where I figured out that Marina was not only a mom of a, um, a colleague of my son, um, her daughter and my son go to school. Um, I learned she was getting a PhD in, um, in business here um, from UTD. So that was very helpful for me to make that connection, which is where we had a conversation then about um, an opportunity to work for one of our strategic partners, which is a company called Re Research International, which has now been acquired by TNS. And what we were doing at the time was to collect information on how people snack and what are the snacking occasions, what are their needs. And so we had invested quite a bit of money. And is there a clicker? Uh, across PepsiCo to have a proprietary piece of research. So what I want to talk about is then if I did know a bunch of, of information about how you eat, when you eat, what are your need states, are you eating with somebody else, and what are the other things that you're eating. It's, it's important for us to have that information so that as we package our products, we market our products, and we look for new uh, opportunities, we need to know that. So when we think about how we could use that kind of information to look forward is, is basically the idea behind this research. So this is, again, a handheld device that they are logging. They log two weeks of diary consumption information. And that information is across both the beverage business and the snack business. And it's been powerful for us to have that kind of information on occasions, needs, states, emotions, channels purchased. <laughs> However, um, uh, probably the biggest part of this is sizing the category. Because you can, and I, I work on the shopper side, so I'm very familiar with using Dunhumby, using databases like AC Nielsen and IRI to size the purchase occasion. But you also have the consumption occasion. And so what is it that's being consumed by which group? Because I could sell Cheetos, and it appears Cheetos goes home to households with kids. But the reality is mom often loves Cheetos more than her kids and will hide them on top of the refrigerator away from the kids. Anybody know anybody like that? No. <laughs> All right, so we know that kind of stuff happens. So there's a disconnect between the shopping behavior and the consumption behavior. And so for us, it's understanding the size of the category, which categories are in growth, which ones are shrinking. Uh, are they decreasing? And we measure it in terms of occasions and also it's self-reported ounces consumed. And I also need to understand, stand, stand, understand, can't talk today, dynamics between, hey, if they're eating what is perceived to be a healthier product, are they eating more of that product than, say, a Fritos? And there's all kinds of learnings around that. Is there any connection to demographics in terms of the number of occasions that they're eating or the amount they're eating to any of the uh, um, need states? So do they eat more in public? Do they eat more on a date? Do they eat more or less? And it, and it all depends. So understanding the needs met and then the demographics. So that's really what we had at our fingertips. The bigger question is, is then how do I look forward and say, how are those eating occasions going to change if I know what I know today? So I know that there are going to be demographic changes that are going to occur. I'm going to know that the Gen Ys are not, nothing like the Gen Xers, that are nothing like the Boomers. They are all very, very different. If you think about how public policy has affected eating right now, I can only put a baked Cheeto, a baked Lay's, a Sun Chips into the school system. So I am changing preference patterns from this point on. I learned that very early on when my son came home and requested a baked Lay's. I don't have baked Lay's at my house. Um, I go fully leaded. <laughs> but that was his choice and his request. And you guys might have, have figured this out yourself with your own kids, maybe consuming more water in flavored water, less sodas. Boomers are the heavy consumers of sodas. It's the number one way I get caffeine delivered in the morning. 
um, because I don't drink coffee. But there are different groups and different behavioral around cohorts that, that are emerging. The other thing is, is multicultural. You guys know this statistic. The Gen Ys are going to be what percent multicultural or are currently? The, they're the majority will be multicultural. So understanding their consumption patterns, understanding regional differences between people that live in the South versus people that live in the East, very different consumption patterns. And these aging boomers. There is a great reality that sets in, and, and Marina can probably quote this off the top of her head, I think I know the number, between the age where you say you're going to do something about your health and the age you actually do something about your health. Anyone want to take a stab at when that age, that intersection of where your behavior matches your attitude? It's about 55-ish. And that's because something happens. You have a heart attack, you have a stroke, you get hypertension, you get, there's a reality that makes the behavior change very, very quickly. So we need to understand then as these boomers are aging rapidly, how it's going to affect future consumption habits. So the paper that was many years in the work because Marina worked for the company and became very familiar that was doing the, collecting the data, so she was very familiar with the data set, we got permission in about 2005 uh, by Jaya Kumar, who uh, had a passion around looking forward and is quite an innovator and actually just got assigned. He's taking the position of leading something called NutriCo, which is a global nutrition group that's going to have its own CMO, its own chief financial officer, and Pepsi's going big around health and wellness. Mainly because if you look at the trends, where the future is, it's hugely important that we get our product mix matching where the future trends are. So uh, Marina, then we, got, we started talking about the possibility, and lo and behold, Dr. Ratchford had done work with Al Carey, our current CEO of Frito-Lay, on projecting the beverage category and forecasting it when he was at, I think, the University of Maryland which is, I think, Al Carey's alumni <laughs> of that. So these connections, everything was, was working for us um, to have a model and experience in this category, have a, have a PhD student who knew how to use the data set and was very familiar with the questions asked. And so where we ended up here is an ability to predict the future. And it's got all the buzz across PepsiCo because when one division has something and the other division doesn't, they all want it. So uh, Marina is getting quite a few calls from the beverage division, which I'm thrilled now that I'm part of PepsiCo. I work across all the divisions. So it's going to be um, fun to see this happen uh, on the beverage side also. So what we learned at the end of this is a couple things. Not a huge surprise that the population is going to increase, and therefore all categories will grow. Now, there were some depressing things that came out of this research, and we did agree to publish. And uh, we needed to have it go through all channels, our CMO, <laughs> our uh, public affairs committee. And the reality is everybody will grow because the population's increasing. So that was the very good news out of this study. And we had to clarify that very clearly because we all have stock on the PepsiCo side. So we want to make sure our stock didn't go down. But the, the reality is the per capita eating occasions will vary significantly in the future based on these demographic changes. So if we project out, and this paper projected out pretty much every year all the way to the year 2030. So if I look out to the year 2030, there's certain dynamics that are going to happen. And the way the model was set up, I love the Excel file that they um, provide because I can look and say, what if income doesn't increase? The first couple years we were doing it, it was a sure shot income was going to go through the roof. What do you think when a recession hits like this? I want to go to the tab that says income stays the same or goes down, or the one where education might go up because people not getting jobs out of undergrad are going on to graduate school. So I do think that some of those trends are a little bit different, and we need to be able to have the flexibility to model those situations that we think are most realistic. So the other thing is, is uh, per capita growth will vary among categories and especially fruit through the roof, uh, veggies somewhat, depending on which of the hypotheses you put in there or, or what you're modeling. Things like unflavored tortilla chips, we see phenomenal growth on those, but not of our flavored tortilla chips like a Doritos or a Cheetos. 
So the nice thing that you can do with, if you look forward and you say, I don't like that reality, what am I going to do? You reinvent the category. And so in the case of Doritos at the time had gotten very involved. Anybody heard of crashing the Super Bowl? Those commercials that are self, are consumer generated? Well, that was a great, looking at the trend line, consumption was going down. So if you model it using the first couple years of this data that we had, it wasn't going to look good at all. But we've been able to, and collecting more and more data, seeing the category change because the brand reinvented itself. So we're really, really excited when we see those kind of changes. But for the most part, there's a lot of stability in the data. So certain brands are going to go down just because the current users are going to change their habits in the future. And those groups that are going to, large, are going to get bigger are not eating those categories today and won't be tomorrow. The other assumption that we built in, and, the, and Marina has, has looked at all the research that was done on, do you take your eating habits with you as a generation? And there's a couple schools of thought. A few articles maybe say that that happens, but, but most of the evidence, if I'm correct, says that that does not happen because of this thing called chronic illness. And so you will eventually need to change your eating habits. That's why when you get older, and I'm sorry if this applies to any of you guys, <laughs> but you choose different foods. What foods do you choose as you get older that you might not have eaten when you were younger? Light beer. Light beer. Oat what oat else? Oatmeal. oatmeal. Good thing we own Quaker foods. Yes. Um, the other one would be nuts. Lots of nut consumption as you age. Almonds. You're, you're obviously not on the bandwagon. <laughs> Excellent. We love that. So, so those changes do happen when you see the multicultural piece coming in there. It's not a huge surprise. Unflavored tortilla chips come up. As people are migrating to the south because taxes are less and it's you know, warmer weather and they're leaving some of the, the cities, the, the colder cities, you see different preferences, eating preferences in those geographies. So you have those kind of dynamics going on. Income and education impact the category assumptions the most. So those two variables and understanding how those will change in the future, and that is because as you become more educated and your income goes up, you have the ability and the knowledge to make different choices in what, what products that you pick. So the impacts, the category selected, the number of occasions, and the amount eaten. Now within all those dynamics are the effects of body mass index. Does that affect? Does anybody think that affects the number of occasions? Do you have a lot more occasions if you have a higher body mass? Marina? <laughs> I, I, actually, I, as I was reviewing the specific article that we had, it looks to me like body mass index, the higher your body mass doesn't mean more occasions. It means you consume more on each of those occasions. So there are those kind of dynamics. As your education goes up, the amount that you consume um, also, it's, you know, it's going to be a reverse relationship. So how did this affect Frito-Lay's culture? What was the impact on politics? And what we really did out of this, uh, Jaya Kumar at the time was the CMO and head in innovation, is really put a lot of weight on health and wellness as a plank and elevating the core. And by that means things like taking out trans fats when people didn't know what a trans fat was. Things like right now you're going to see on your shelves, and hopefully you'll go by, coming out this next year, our biggest innovation, is all natural. All natural on our, on our Lays line. Taking out all the perceptions that we got all this stuff and trying to get all of that gone. So anything that is perceived as processed or unhealthy to remove those from the core. Reducing salt levels because we know hypertension is a problem and we know a lot of kids have type 2 diabetes um, or are um, picking up obesity. So we want to deal with all those chronic conditions and make sure our products match. So elevating the core is very, very important to us as well as revolutionizing health and wellness. I'll give you an example of um, Cheetos as a case study and um, 
three products. I'm missing some stuff on my slide, but I, I'm going to go with it. So with Cheetos, if you know cheese puffs as a category is going to decline as we were currently marketing at the time to kids, two, two dynamics going on. One is we're not going to be able to market to kids. That's not a good, good idea from a public policy standpoint. And the second thing is that I've got a whole population of aging boomers. What if I took and marketed to the kid in you? So you love Cheetos. You're mischievous. Wouldn't you want some Chester to be talking to you? So I brought in my base. So those are the strategies that, that we're taking to address the fact that, that the future eaters was going to be a narrow set than we currently had. Another example is things like True North, which is let's take nuts and make them more exciting. Let's cluster them. Let's add ingredients. Let's mix it up. Let's take Stacy's Pita Chips, which is a company we acquired years ago, or Sabra hummus and let's really focus on going after occasions and food and put it together for our aging boomers moving forward. Sun Chips is, is another brand because it's multi-grain. So where are we moving forward in the future? We're doing yearly updates. Marina gets the call a lot. <laughs> no telling how many calls she gets because everybody's figured out how influential this has been in setting strategy across PepsiCo. Expanding to beverage category, like I mentioned, and the dissertation opportunities. This, what we have is a lot, a lot, a lot of data. But we're just like any other big company, resource constrained in terms of warm bodies. So I do see many, many dissertation opportunities to take data sets like this and others that we have and really go to town on them. And then modeling effect on shopping behavior. I'd love to do the same thing since I sit on the shopper side. If today's Walmart shoppers are X, what will happen to Walmart moving forward? Are they going to be our Gen Y shopping Walmart or are they shopping Target? Are they shopping um, Safeway or are they shopping Kroger? And those are things that then you can model out and, for, and look forward to and help our retailers in the year 2030. And these are things that they just aren't able to do due to resources. So thank you very much. I thank Marina and Dr. Rackford for all their help on this project. <laughs>